Good evening and welcome to the Lobby for Cyprus seminar at Theodor Dechnis, the 48th year of the invasion and occupation of our country Cyprus. Um, I'd like to first of all thank several members of our community who are here tonight. Um, Gostas Biberidis is here. He's a member of the Executive Council of uh, Vigo United Kingdom uh, at the back there. Um, I was expecting Dr. Savas Hadjifilipu, who should be here shortly. He's the president of the Greek uh, Cypriot Doctors Association. Um, and some other guests, as they arrive, I will introduce you to them. Uh, also, I just want to say welcome to Vasily Banayi, because Vasily Banayi has got, on this Friday, he's got a very important, uh, uh, I think it's a live event, isn't it, here at Theodor Dechnis to celebrate Cyprus Week. Thank you, Vasily. Um, I just want to start by reading the um, article that we placed for the, 20, for the 48th anniversary of the invasion and occupation of Cyprus. And um, this was published today, and I'd like to thank the executive of lobby, in particular Christos Evangelou. On the 20th of July, 2022, while the attention of the world would be on the war in Ukraine, Lobby for Cyprus will mark the passage of 48 years since Turkey launched the first of two brutal invasions of the Republic of Cyprus. As has been well documented, Turkey used a coup against the government of the Republic of Cyprus, which was orchestrated on the 15th of July 1974 by the Hunda, then ruling Greece, as a pretext to invade the Republic and implement a premeditated plan. As a result of its two invasions, the second of which was launched on the 14th of August 1974, three weeks after the collapse of the Kupist regimes in Athens and Nicosia, Turkey ethnically cleansed, as well as illegally occupied, 36% of the Republic of Cyprus and 57% of its coastline. Turkey thereby enforced a de facto apartheid-style segregation while Cypriot citizens of Greek and Christian heritage forced to live in the south and Cypriot citizens of Turkish and Muslim heritage forced to live in the Turkish occupied north. In 1974, Turkey not only undermined the sovereignty, independence and territorial integrity of a virtually undefended member state of the UN, the Council of Europe and the Commonwealth, Turkey, a country with a second largest military in NATO, flagrantly violated the UN Charter, international humanitarian law, European human rights, and numerous treaties. In pursuit of its premeditated plan and segregationist agenda, Turkey was responsible for multiple illegal outcomes, including the forcible transfer of approximately 170,000 Greek and Christian Cypriot citizens from their homes in the Turkish occupied north of the Republic, while coercing tens of thousands of Turkish and Muslim citizens of the Republic to move in the other direction. The mass colonization of the Turkish occupied north with citizens of Turkey, the mass murder of people, the mass rape of women, of women and girls, and the enforced disappearance of prisoners of war, the systematic destruction of the Greek and Christian heritage of the Turkish occupied north, the plunder of the natural resources of the Republic of Cyprus in the Turkish occupied north, as well as in the Turkish occupied territorial sea of the Republic, and the creation of an illegal state of affairs which has enabled the criminal underworld and fugitives from justice to flourish. In 1974, as the world looked the other way, illegality triumphed and a culture of impunity was enforced in Southeast Europe decades before Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022. Since 1974, the Republic of Cyprus has been held hostage by Turkey and those powerful states that, via the UN, have attempted to appease Turkey and foist on the Republic a so-called bicommunal by zonal federation, a proposed solution in line with the long-standing demands of Turkey. Today, 48 years on, Lobby for Cyprus reiterates its opposition to any solution based on the bicommunal 
segregation of the citizens of the same sovereign state, and the bizonal carve-up of its territory into two homogenous ethno-religious zones. Any such solution would validate Turkey's aggressive, discriminatory, and segregationist policies. It would turn a post-solution Cyprus into a satrap of Erdogan's increasingly authoritarian, irredentist, Islamist, and nationalistic Turkey. And it would set a dangerous precedent for democracy worldwide. Western states have been resolute in opposing Turkey's invasion and occupation in Ukraine, but have they tolerated Turkey's invasions and occupation of the, of the Republic of Cyprus? Are Western states promoting, in plain sight, a two-tier system of principles, international law, and human rights standards, with one tier applied to enemies and another applied on a politically expedient basis for one of their partners? Lobby for Cyprus will never lose sight of the fact that this organization was founded 30 years ago in 1992 by ordinary people who were forcibly displaced from their homes by Turkey and compelled to rebuild their lives in the United Kingdom. As a defender of the rights and freedoms of all forcibly displaced citizens of the Republic of Cyprus, irrespective of ethnicity or religion, Lobby for Cyprus continues to campaign for a democratic, humane, and just settlement that establishes an international legal framework which enables all citizens of the Republic of Cyprus to return to their homes and properties and removes all Turkish military personnel from the Republic and humanely repatriates all of Turkey's colonists subject to legitimate exceptions. Forty years on since Turkey invaded the Republic of Cyprus in 1974, and 30 years on since the establishment of Lobby for Cyprus in 1992, Lobby for Cyprus continues to reject the discriminatory solution and visit by Turkey, as it would reward aggression, occupation, illegality, and impunity. At the same time, Lobby for Cyprus continues to call for a settlement that promotes democratic values, human rights, individual freedoms, and the rule of law. Thank you. Well, now we go straight into our seminar for tonight. And um, uh, you have the leaflet, and um, I'm sure that you've read uh, what the objectives of tonight's seminar are. And um, we have with us tonight some very important panelists. And uh, I would like to just say a few words about each of the panelists so we get some background uh, for each of them. I will start with uh, David Burrows. David. David was a Conservative Member of Parliament for Enfield Southgate from 2005 to 2017, and we know how passionate he was during his term uh, as a Member of Parliament uh, for Cyprus. He is the co-founder of the Conservative Christian Fellowship and Parliamentary Private Secretary between 2012 and 2014, but he's currently Chairman of the Equity Release Council and the Prime Minister's Deputy Special Envoy for Freedom of religion or belief, and parliamentary director of Conservative Christian Fellowship. Dasullah Hajitofi, also known as the Icon Hunter, one of the largest art trafficking acting operations in hi European history. Her efforts had, to, had led to arrest one of the Turkish art smugglers, Aydin Dikman. Dikman, and the confiscation of over 60 million dollars worth of looted artifacts from Cyprus and around the world. These experiences led Dasula Hachitofi to create Walk of Truth, a non-governmental organization with a mission of combating art trafficking by creating reforms to protect cultural heritage and conflict areas. Some of her accolades, uh, she was nominated as Woman of Europe 2008 for outstanding work in fighting art trafficking, and Dasula was the first female to award, be awarded the highest honor in Cyprus, the Order of St. Barnabas. Dr. Theodora Christou. Theodora is a barrister and academic who lectures, researches, and consults on numerous areas of law under the overarching theme of transnational law and governance. She has extensive global experience having worked in over 20 jurisdictions and on projects covering 80 jurisdictions. Dr. Theodora, Christou has been an executive committee 
member of the Bar Human Rights Committee for 12 years, and she currently lectures in law at the London School of Economics and Queen Mary University of London. Um, the Deputy High Commissioner of the Republic of Cyprus, Mr. Nicolas Manolis, should be here shortly. Um, he's the Deputy High Commissioner here in, the, in London, representing the Republic of Cyprus. He's a seasoned diplomat, and he's been stationed uh, all over the world, and he will soon be leaving and moving to Qatar. So we'll welcome him when he arrives. Finally, Mr. George Evgeniou, Theodor, Mr. Theodor Dechnis. <laughs> Uh, George was born in Limassol, came to London in the 1950s to study theatre. He has an extensive film and television work, which included Danger Man and Dixon of Doc Green, which uh, some of us do remember. Um, he's an author of numerous plays and trilogies. But in 1957, George founded Theodor Dechnis, and in 1967, he initiated the Cyprus Week, an annual festival to highlight the Cypriot culture and way of life in the United Kingdom and to create a greater awareness of the struggle of Cyprus against British colonialism and Turkish invasion of Cyprus. He also is one of the founders of the National Federation of Cypriots in England. And in 1968, he created the first Cypriot advisory service in the United Kingdom, which has helped thousands of Cypriot migrants and refugees receive welfare benefits, education, or housing. Finally, there will be question and answers at the end of the session. And um, I'd first like to start with Mr. Nigo Savidis, who is going to um, present a song. But yes, I, I apologize. I have uh, forgotten to mention that we have with us um, from the Greek Embassy, Mrs. Eleni Supiana, from the Press and Information Office of the Greek Embassy. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, may I call Nigo Savidis, please, for the first song? And if you'll see, some of us have on our chairs the two songs. The first song is Kypros Agabimeni, Beloved Cyprus. It's in Greek. And the second one is Fonazi Amohostos. Kalispera se olus. Good evening to my good old friends David and, of course, Tasula from Famagusta, who I'm glad to say we are very good friends for many, many years. Welcome, Tasula. Nice to see you, David. And of course, the lobby. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thanks. Come <laughs> Σαν μελωδία αγγελική που μου καηδεύει την ψυχή. Σαν ψαμωδία τη λαλή ψιθύριστα φωνάζει Μια φωνή μέσα μου ξυπνά που μου χαϊδεύει την καρδιά Στη μνήμη μου έρχεται ξανά με ξαναφέρνει στα παλιά σε τόπο όμορφο γνωστό Λάβηκα φωνάζει αμόχωστος
gusto Flaviga con ese amor gusto Sa mi aglica mu salvoi Ana vi floga Σε μια γκάλη μαγική Είσαι ο κόρφος ο γνωστός Ψαλμωδικά φωνάς για Too many for me. I'm taking personally, you know what I mean? <laughs> 48 years. Yeah. I mean, who can say anything more than that? So, as Theo said, I will be reading out the address by the Presidential Commissioner, Mr. Fodius Fodil, um, to, for this seminar in London on the 48th anniversary of the Turkish invasion and Turkey's continuing effort for the final Turkification of the occupied areas. Wednesday, 20th of July, 2022. Compatriots, ladies and gentlemen, I would first like to congratulate the organizers of this promising and much needed seminar. Scientific analysis and the presentation of the real aims of Turkey in regard to the Cyprus problem are certainly of particular value and significance on a sorrowful day like this, 48 years since the despicable Turkish invasion. The topic of the seminar is a true reflection of the real Turkish designs for Cyprus stretching back decades. Such designs have become all too obvious lately as the other side puts forward the demand for us to accept a two-state solution as a prerequisite for resuming the negotiation process. The definite Turkification of our occupied territory through the destruction of our religious and cultural heritage, the change of place names, the attempts to erase any trace of our historical patrimony and our link to the land of our ancestors, forms part of a plan that was set in motion as far back as 1956. I refer to the chronology in particular because the well-known notorious plan of Nihat Erim, Prime Minister of Turkey, the aim got underway of preventing the union of Cyprus with Greece on the one hand and repossessing Cyprus by Turkey on the other. By repossession, I mean, of course, in accordance with the Turkish views and revisionist beliefs. This plan has uh, since then been implemented without digressions by all the governments of Turkey. Its aims are fivefold. The first aim, of preventing union with Greece was achieved since a form of independence wrought with all sorts of problems was imposed on us by British chicanery. The second aim was for Turkey to obtain rights over Cyprus. Turkey did not have any such rights because it had denounced them by the Treaty of Lausanne. However, this objective too was attained through the Zurich-London agreements. As a result, Turkey became a guarantor power with a military contingent on the island ever since. The third aim was to create enclaves by the forceful concentration of Turkish Cypriots so as to form compact homogeneous masses in order to appear as having a state structure while refusing to obey the legitimate recognized state. This too they succeeded in doing through the Turkish Cypriot illegal mutiny of 1963-64. The fourth aim was to overthrow the overthrow of the population ratio of 82 to 18 percent. It was brought about through the transportation and establishment of settlers immediately after the Turkish invasion. 
Colonization is certainly illegal, but it is there, a reality which we do not recognize it yet exists. The fifth is the full control of the occupied territory by Turkey. Through a strong military presence, numerous interventions in the daily lives of Turkish Cypriots and by the control of the pseudo government seeking the destruction and removal of all Greek and Christian elements. Um, the ultimate aim is the total and irreversible Turkification of the occupied part of our country. It is an endeavor that on account of the attributes of Erdogan's administration, it has in recent years taken on the character of Islamization of the occupied areas. This is happening through the full control that Turkey holds, especially over religious and educational matters. Ladies and gentlemen, there remains still unfulfilled an additional sixth aim that the deep state of Turkey has set in regard to Cyprus the aim of taking full political control of the island. Notwithstanding the problems and weaknesses of the Zurich-London agreements, we are and shall continue to be a state recognized by the United Nations and all other international organizations. A European Union member state, a state that enters into international agreements and cooperation with other states on an equal footing. This is the reality that Turkey seeks to abrogate through the type of solution it envisages for the creation of a new state drafted from scratch. However, for as long as the Republic of Cyprus exists, protected by the resolutions of the United Nations and the decisions of the European Union, this aim will never be achieved. The Republic of Cyprus and its internationally recognized statehood is the main and basic weapon in our effort to counter Turkish designs against us. Dear friends, let me reassure you that we are all resolved to defend the Republic of Cyprus and the rights that derive from its existence and functioning in today's world with all our might and will, while in no case forsaking our rights and endeavors for a solution that will rid us of the Turkish occupation and help us to reunite our country. This debt we owe to those who fought and sacrificed themselves for our freedom as well as to the coming generations of Cypriot Hellenism, the future of which we should safeguard as rightfully guided by our 35 century long history on this sacred land. In closing, let me once again thank the organizers and speakers and wish them every success in achieving the objectives of this seminar. For this for you. I would like to just thank uh, the President and Commissioner. They've been very supportive from Cyprus to lobby for Cyprus over the years. And um, the initiative uh, for us to, uh, to actually have the seminar was uh, based on the discussion that I had with the President and Commissioner some time ago. Um, we'll now move on. And our very special guest who came all the way from Holland today, Dasula. I hope you're not too tired, Dasula. So um, today is a sad day for Cyprus since 1974 and a very sad day for humanity. It is absolutely devastating that after 48 years of occupation, Cyprus still has no justice and Turkey is even further from the rule of law um, than 48 years ago. Given the loss of values globally, where we apply law when it suits political, national and economic interests of countries, with the voice of the strong and powerful being selective to justice as a compatriot of yours, I am asking you to reflect and think together what can we do to change the status quo for Cyprus. I can only share my own reflections and experiences as a human rights campaigner using alternative narratives. I must emphasize the urgent need to change our narrative, which 48 years, it just doesn't sell anymore. Why does my narrative sell and why does the Cyprus issue the way we present it does not sell? And what can we do to change that? First of all, my voice is your voice. 
is every citizen's voice. A personal story, which is the language of the new global world of technology. Personal stories and individual opinions matter as they can be published globally overnight and influence policymakers. One tweet you can reach the President of USA and any powerful person. Cyprus not only did not utilize the personal stories or narratives, but actually kills them. My work is unfortunately only within Cyprus projected as church success, government success, and any civil servant success, but not the journey of a refugee claiming her right to go home by bringing looted antiquities back home. So my voice is taken away when they present it otherwise. Second, before any speech I make anywhere, I make sure that my team watches global co politics and I pitch the Cyprus issue next to it to bring the issue to surface. For example, yesterday, the Presidency of Turkey published an official text entitled Joint Statement by the President of the Islamic Republic of Iran, the President of the Russian Federation, and the President of the Republic of Turkey. The joint statement not only confirms that Iran, Russia, and Turkey are building an alliance which clearly threatens the US the UK and the EU. It also confirms that President Erdogan is growing increasingly close to President Putin and that Turkey is distancing itself from both NATO, of which it is supposed to form part, and the EU, of which it is supposed to be a candidate country. If I start my speech to a foreign policy maker with the Cyprus issue, I will turn him or her off the moment I open my mouth. That's my experience in Holland. If, however, I approach them by telling them, have you watched yesterday's joint statement of Iran and Turkey, and where do you think Turkey is heading? I have engaged in a global issue. I'm directing our conversation around Turkey, and I can feed my views to that person, including the Cyprus issue. Now, we need to assess why would I win the other person's support? In other words, what's in it for them? Why would they help me? So, we come to the next point of what we, as Cypriots, diplomats and diaspora and any citizen can do. Well, we watch the national news, I mean UK, and find common hooks to align the interests of Cyprus with the interests of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth. For example, as a continuation of the above point, the United Kingdom, its uh, British bases and the Republic of Cyprus face a common threat in the form of Russian arms transfers to Turkey, such as the transfer of the Russian S-400 missile system from Russia to Turkey, and second, the Russian-built nuclear power station at Akuyu in Turkey, which is 85 kilometers north of the Turkish occupied coastline of Kyrenia district. Did you know that neither Russia nor Turkey have signed the treaty for the nuclear weapons disarmament? Is it to the United Kingdom's interest that Putin, Iran, and Erdogan are heading further away from the rule of law. Do you know of the Islamiz do they know of the Islamization of the occupied part of Cyprus, particularly the last ten years? Are they way are they aware of Turkey's brilliant ability to avoid signing international treaties without a small window for its implementation and to be held accountable? Who else might be worried about Turkey? Can we join forces with the Armenians who are suffering from Azerbaijan in Nagorno-Karabakh and Turkey is feeding Azerbaijan with arms? Can we align with the Armenian diaspora 
and learn how they managed to invoke the law of discrimination and took Azerbaijan to the International Criminal Court and won in The Hague and Cyprus after 48 years has failed to do so. We failed to bring Turkey to the international courts in my home city in The Hague. So back to the UK though, which topics are close to the heart of the British so we can work with them and how and how? For example, we need to monitor the EU family policies and see how, how Cyprus can comply and still align its, its interests with UK given Brexit. For example, the UK, its British sovereign bases and the Republic of Cyprus face common threats in the form of, first, human trafficking and people trafficking, including child trafficking, from or via Turkey and the Turkish occupied north of the Republic of Cyprus. Second, conflict-related sexual violence of the type seen of the occupied area in 74 and in the Kurdish populated parts of Turkey. The plight of women and girls in Turkey and the occupied area is particularly worrying, especially in view of Turkey's unilateral withdrawal from the two 2011 Council of Europe Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence. How can we reach out to these Turkish women who suffer in the hands of Erdogan and mobilize them as our allies? I can tell you that at least five of those women globally are very close friends of mine and very close collaborators. How can a small country like Cyprus create an important position by using its unique selling points and what soft issues can we champion in order to unify opinion shapers regardless of what their background globally? How can we reposition Cyprus as a useful country partner rather than a troubled child that needs help? Enough is enough. So, we must try to create a unique position for Cyprus as alongside Malta, a country which is both EU member and Commonwealth. After Brexit, Malta and Cyprus are the only EU member states that are in the Commonwealth and EU. In addition, Ireland, Malta and Cyprus are the only three EU member states with a common law tradition inherited from England. The protection of cultural heritage and the promotion of religious freedoms can both be promoted in this context, particularly in view of the continuing post-Brexit status of the UK as a member state of the Council of Europe, which is not the same as the EU. However, in order to achieve the above, we, the Cypriots, must be truthful to ourselves and our compatriots about expectations. Speak truths and not allow party politics to divide us, whether back home or as diaspora. We have allowed the political parties to divide us. We never had a debate and a common strategy for our national issue. Instead, we have allowed the political parties to use the Cyprus issue to serve themselves to the detriment of our country. We have allowed ourselves to fight with one another and regret even decisions of the past with the wisdom and experience of today and question our heroes who gave their lives for our freedom. We must learn to forgive ourselves first, speak truth to one another and learn from our mistakes and draft a common strategy for our country for the future. Can we? I use cultural heritage that is a language to defend human rights in international humanitarian law. Right to memory, right to pray, right to go home, the right to the truth. What is needed is the proper application and robust enforcement of the international treaties in relation to international humanitarian law, the law of occupation and European human rights law which are binding on Turkey. 
These include the Fourth Geneva Convention of 1949, the European Convention on Human Rights of 1950, and the De Hague Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of War and Armed Conflict of 1954. Cultural and religious heritage is also a language of inclusion and integration, demanding respect for our diversity as Christian Orthodox and our special role with the icons for our prayers. This strategy exposes Turkey being non-compliant to discrimination law, humanitarian law, etc. The problem is that Turkey has distanced itself from key instruments of law. For example, Turkey has never signed and thus has never ratified even the second protocol of the De Hague Convention of 1954 for the protection of cultural property in the event of armed conflict. And that speaks about uh, occupation, actually. So, in addition, Turkey has never even signed the 1998 Rome Statute on the International Criminal Court, the ICC, as we know it in The Hague. So, we must campaign with one voice, united, and report to international courts um, by, um, uh, uh, and to international bodies. We never did that, and we have allowed Turkey off the hook by reducing the Cyprus issue to a bicommunal local conflict. United to have a working group to reflect on what truly happened with the Cyprus issue and draft a strategy forward. This can only be done from the diaspora if we do not allow the political parties to divide us, which they did. We must bring the new ways and experiences of our countries abroad to our people back home and not bring the small political tactics of Cyprus abroad. Islamization and persecution of Christians is a topical issue and yet nobody pitches Cyprus in this light. Religious freedoms is a human right and yet, we speak about solutions based on human rights and none of the solutions offered to Cyprus to date is based on the fundamental issue of one man, one vote. We are stuck and we are not willing to accept that we must change our narrative. None of the aspiring presidents-to-be has offered a strategy that will upgrade the Cyprus issue to a level where the world will listen to us. None of them has the courage to speak truth to us and confess we, we are, for whatever reason, stuck in a dead end. We must decide if we will mobilize ourselves and show them the way by using a platform which will not threaten them, but walk next to them. If yes, we must mobilize, for example, the women of Cyprus to walk next to our politicians and draft alternative narratives which are respected and understood worldwide. It is for this reason that I accepted to be the president of the Ligion Elenidon Amohostu, the first women's charity foundation in Cyprus since 1930. If you believe in this, I urge you to become members and friends of the Ligion Elenidon, and I am at your disposal, and so are all those women, to plan our strategy for bringing the voice of Cyprus on the global stage via Walk of Truth and the Cultural Heritage or Ligion Elinidon of Famagusta. I will not say anything about the recent conference because my esteemed friend David is the reason I was invited, so I'm sure he will say, but we'll speak further about what can we do together. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dasula. A um, couple of things that I, I found very, very interesting, and one reasonably to the end, and I think a few of us here tonight also would um, uh, support that. It's, um, you mentioned that um, uh, do not bring the political parties abroad. Yeah. Um, that's interesting, because that's something we've been discussing, a lot of us, and uh, Doros here and others have made their comments that um, 
What is the role of the political parties of Cyprus here in the UK? It's a question. What is their role? Um, why should they be involved in mainly our um, federation? Why? Um, why should the political parties be involved? So these are questions which people have been asking, um, and I've been hearing them, and I don't know really what the answers are. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned it, because it's something that I think that a lot of people have understood, and um, we don't know the real answers to that uh, question. And I'll be interested to hear from anyone else uh, later in the question and answers. I want to say, oh, sorry. Yes? Uh, um, I just want to mention the Armenians, you, uh, you saw the application which was done by the Armenian government in the International Court of Justice. I happen to know how it was prepared. And it was prepared by a network of academic women and men advisors uh, from law firms. But it was this network of women that sat down and prepared it, working worldwide, and went to the law firms that worked in the UK, in uh, uh, US, whatever, and they got free advice. And then they gave it to the government, they said, do it. Mm -hmm. So why can't we, there's so much brains in the diaspora, why could we not do the same? And we sit and wait, and we get fed with what they give us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, um, thank you much, Philogo for Cyprus, for inviting me. Um, my, my involvement goes back a fair way, actually, uh, with um, not least the Lobby for Cyprus. I think it was some 20 years ago when I was standing for Parliament uh, for Edmonton um, and came across Lobby for Cyprus in a field in uh, White Hart Lane. Um, and that was my first taste of, of what, um, what Lobby for Cyprus was about and continues to be about. And, uh, so just I praise your consistency and determination, but you wouldn't want me to be praising that consistency for so many years to have to, and that is why there's such profound sadness, deep, deep sadness, and indeed shame and shamefulness of the fact that we're here 48 years on. And I want to talk a bit about that, and then really the reason why I'm here, because why am I here? Um, <laughs> I'm not uh, a member of parliament, I've got no reasons to garner any votes. Um, that's not what I'm wasn't in fact really about, about Cyprus, and, but it's because I care about that profound sadness that we are still here and wanted to sort of draw out perhaps some thoughts about what can provoke and rattle the cage. Uh, I think that's what needs to happen because sadly, you know, we all can totally agree and I don't want to in any way understate who's to blame, what's to blame is, is obviously Turkey, but when we're reflecting on uh, sitting here in the UK, why is this going on, this grievous uh, abuse of human rights? Why is that happening uh, on all our watches? And we all have to take some uh, responsibility for that, uh, not least the Cypriot community, which I was proud to serve many of them uh, for 12 years. But nevertheless, um, I saw uh, both my time in uh, representing one of the most significant diasporas around, but also then visiting and visiting uh, and meeting Cypriots, uh, not least in Cyprus, how too many are indifferent and are fatigued and just are accepting the status quo. For some it suits them, but, but what I've always been impressed about those from the Lobby for Cyprus who are provoking, who are not settling uh, for the status quo and are profoundly agitated um, about um, what is on all our watches. Um, but just, um, just a, a sort of survey, um, uh, how many non-Cypriots are here? One, two, three. And so that's one of the, the, the questions and the challenges um, for the fact that this is a shared concern. It is a profoundly, and quite rightly, because it's a personal issue. It's a profound personal tragedy. It's a profound community tragedy. It's a Cypriot tra tragedy. It's a regional tra uh, tragedy, it's frankly a global tragedy, and it's a, human a humanitarian and human rights tragedy, which should be a shared concern. It should be one that's uh, as concern for non-Cypriots as much for Cypriots, although one, one can't walk the shoes uh, and, and, and walk in terms of the tragic story that we've, I've heard from Tsula and to others. Um, but it's something which should be a shared concern. So that's what I want to just draw out to you, why is it not such a, a shared concern? 
Um, the, but just a little bit back in my, my journey, because hopefully that will just give some insight. Um, so so my, my journey is obviously as a Member of Parliament for Renfrew Southgate when I had no excuse but to take seriously concerns of Cypriots and I see friends and others here uh, who've uh, been encouraging me along that way to take seriously um, what is happening. And I've been to delegations with Mary and others and, uh, and, and, and seen and heard uh, many looking at ways that we can try and um, bridge divides but also um, get to the point where we're not talking about a problem but a solution in, in Cyprus. Um, but but uh, during that time I've been, and I'm kind of a, a restless soul and wanting to see things, I don't just simply like to go through the motions of going to meetings and delegations as, as important as they are, but just trying to see what can we do about this, what could be done about this. And, and so my, my journey took me, um, courtesy actually of Nick there actually, um, to, as, a, as a private visit just for my family, just when we were visiting uh, Cyprus, um, to, uh, to Eftikomi and to see for myself um, what we've just seen, sadly, and reminded of ourselves. And we need to be keep, keep reminded of ourselves of the, the destruction of uh, culture, of identity, of people's um, uh, cemeteries, of for loved ones, of churches, of, you know, it's when I was seeing for myself, you know, just being treated as a as a refuse, as a, as a place for feeding for animals and, and just that disrespect and um, lack of appreciation in a, in, a, in a Commonwealth country, in a country in Europe, to, to see that happening on our watch just distressed me and st still does when I think about it. But then seeing the connection with um, Nick and with his family and, and seeing that that's, it, we're not just talking about uh, issues of of property destruction, we're talking about the profound impact on people, on families, on dignity, on relationships, and it's those those sort of, and that's why the personal stories, the the uh, the relationship with people and with families, with communities that that I was able to see that that really really impacted me. Not least because, like us all, we have families and communities we we care about, our loved ones, our relatives, the respect that we hold or not with them, and that that's just a very normal issue that is of concern for, for ordinary folk who are just concerned about how we relate to one another, how we're concerned about each other's dignity and basic human rights. So it sort of agitated me that this just can't go on without a noise, without something happening about it, which, which does involve lots of different levels of action and involves bringing people together where we can, if he, indeed people that we don't think are necessarily on our side of that co-belligerency it involves trying to bring communities together around Cyprus, but also in, not least in the UK, to try and find a way of getting this issue of not just being a communal, indeed a bicommunal issue, but an issue of profound human rights concern, and one that um, goes beyond just the, the, um, the borders of Cyprus. So, so I suppose just my, my journey led me into various bits of action, some that, um, not least, I'm not sure everyone here who indeed approved of it all, and certainly not all the community did, and certainly those in um, political representation, talk about political parties. There's one of my reflections on the failing of uh, Cypriot political parties uh, coming into uh, and influencing what happens in the UK is that we, you, what happens is you just shadow the same divisions, the same problems, the same issues and don't lead to any context that breaks through that. And, and so, you know, there's those in leading positions in particularly one political party that seem to sort of stop me pro provoking some kind of what is needed, which is greater civic action and greater political action. And from a civic action point of view, um, there was my, so with such a diaspora in the UK of what can, what, what needs to have, what, what, how can we agitate more action? Now certainly there's the relationship to, you know, provoke and encourage more members of parliament to take an interest in all party parliamentary groups, in Friends of Cyprus groups, and I played my part in, you know, broadening the Conservative Friends of Cyprus, and it's great to see Doris and others, and to, 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 to ensure that um, and it's something that Friends of Cyprus ought to do, to try and get a, a breadth that goes across those that should be interested to those that, they, to those that have to be interested to those that should be interested. And so we extended the interest from the MPs for Cleethorpes down to Cornwall, um, to Gower, over to Great Yarmouth. And so that, that, a, a wider interest. And, and what um, provoked many of those when I took them on visits was 
um, yes, seeing and listening to the politicians, but actually hearing from ordinary people impacted by what is happening from going to the fence of Famagusta and seeing that lost city frozen in time by seeing you know, what has been missed and lost. And yes, indeed, privately and sensitively going over to uh, the north to just see the, the state of cultural, uh, religious cultural and heritage destruction and destruction of lives and, um, and basic human uh, aspects, not least a respect for those who've gone before us and who've died and that awful, awful disrespect for cemeteries. So it led me to think that we need to do some more civic and political action. And so the civic action I um, considered, well, why is it that um, you know, recognizing the sensitivities and respecting some will not want to go over to the north and fully understand it, but why is it that there is not this, why is it that we have the situation where because of the occupation there is not an ordinary manifestation of people's right to do the ordinary things, including to uh, believe, to, it's their, to people's religion will include a respect for those who've died. And the disrespect in cemeteries really, really, really affected me. I went with a new MP, friend, friend for North Nick to Borough, and when I took him over and he saw what it was like, he just couldn't believe that that was happening, that, that there were crosses that were smashed up, that there was just a complete lack of care for, uh, for, for issues like cemeteries. And so just more symbolic of really the, the um, disdain, the indifference, the, um, the the dreadful situation. It's not the only reason, the only, the only symbol. And so out of that, I, that we've got to do something more, a civic action. So I, um, I sought to organise a number of volunteers from different village associations and some who'd not gone before to go over to the north, to simply to clear up their cemeteries, to be able to be in the churches where they'd been baptised and where they'd worshipped maybe one, uh, so at a young age, to be able to go back and actually just clear up the cemeteries where their loved ones had died. And it was problematic, it was sensitive, it was controversial, and I was um, dissuaded from going. Indeed, I, some sort of banned me from going. Um, and that wasn't just Turkey. And uh, the uh, so TRNC, who, who sought to then um, basically try and find ways to stop it to threaten me, to say that you would be at risk going to close to military zones, that you would be under potential attack. I went with members of parliament who led this civic action, which was, which was threatening. You know, having politicians going from delegations and meeting politicians is okay, is controllable, but having politicians leading a volunteer army over to clear up uh, cemeteries and to, or at least to do a little bit of clearing up and to symbolically say, this cannot go on, we can't walk by on the other side was threatening to a lot of people. It was threatening to vested interests on both sides of the, of the fence, as it were. But nevertheless, we went. Um, unfortunately, the 100 volunteer army got dissuaded by um, threats by, um, by both sides saying, this is not what you should do. And it got down to, say, maybe 20 or so went along. And the MPs went with me. And they were profoundly impacted, as we were. The, the, in fact, in talking to people locally on the ground, indeed, Turkish Cypriots, as well as Greek Cypriots coming with us, that realizing that you know, this, we're not talking about an issue of religious conflict, uh, we're not talking about, uh, we're talking about an issue where there's been an imposed position, not least by an occupation, on people's ordinary wish to do something about this. And in fact, there was a welcome to us by uh, the local mayors, as it were, to say, we just don't know what to do about it. And in fact, we went to one, uh, one, one village where suddenly, because we were coming, um, the so-called authorities decided to try and do a quick clean-up before we got there. The first time it happened, I think, in 30 years, they quickly did a, a mow of some, a lawn and, it was, you know. But it just showed that we'd, all it showed, it was, not, it was only tiny, but it showed that we'd provoked a reaction because they'd wanted to ignore it and let it go. You know, I got um, in the tabloids in the north um, on the front page, um, you know, saying, you know, Am I going to, you know, just, just pillowing me in and, and abusing me? And I think there'd been an arson attack um, at a, a, a mosque in, in uh, Larnaca, you know, unrelated at all to any issue, they're just some arsonists. And they'd put me on the front of the page with the, the mosque burning, saying, clear this up, you know, just playing it. Um, but it just shows that we've got to provoke action. And that, indeed, the folk who came with me, they, for the first time, were, were appreciative of just having that reconnection 
with their cemetery to pay their respects. Uh, we went and did some clearing up, just a small inner church where there was people visiting who hadn't been there back since they'd been baptised and just appreciated that there was someone trying to clear up some of the debris and the ditch, the awful mess there. Just small, we weren't cleaning it all up, we weren't solving a big problem, but just showing that we're not going to forget this, we're not going to ignore this. So it's that civic action and political action that spurred me on to say that we must do more internationally as well. And um, in fact, I think on one of those visits, I came back and met Tasuda for the first time in a cafe in Nicosia. And we started talking and having a shared concern about... Oh, you met the Dutch girl who told you about me. Maybe. And then I met you in the lobby. Less, too much information. <laughs> <laughs> Which Dutch girl? But anyway, either way, um, the, 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 the fact was that we had a common concern about this, trying to break down these barriers and you know, with a restless spirit, uh, as someone who's somewhat revolutionary as well, realising that we need to do more. So, so what did we, we then do? Well, what happened next was realising that, OK, let's try and do something in Parliament. So we together, we set up, uh, we had an event, in the event there was an event in the House of Lords that was provoked from, I've got a common concern, a long standing concern about trafficking and seeing the exploitation of human beings and uh, that, that lack of human dignity, which actually is linked very much with you know, the, the, the exploitation and trafficking of property and heritage. And it comes together on a human dignity concern. And, and uh, Tasula then uh, was spoken, we had those important events in the House of Lords that brought together some senior academics, um, some uh, passionate speakers uh, to try and do more, to try and rattle the cage, not least of the UK government, about ratifying the Hague Convention which would provide some, um, some uh, opportunity, a legal opportunity to uh, take criminal action against trafficking. What it then led to was the setting up of an all-party parliamentary group for the protection of cultural heritage, which I chaired and established, Tasula helping with the secretariat of support and the expertise. And we brought together people who are concerned about culture, about the museums, um, about heritage, the archaeologists, as well as those people concerned together with human rights and trafficking concerns, to really build up a momentum, which then led to the government having to do something about it. And it led to the government then eventually passing legislation to ratify the Hague Convention to have a fund for protection of cultural heritage and it then led to a, a wider movement of concern. And the terrorist bill in relation to our trafficking, remember? Absolutely. That, that, that so, so all this is just an illustrative that it is possible when we just build others who are concerned and interested and the centrepiece in, in my speech and others around this uh, ratification of the Hague Convention is, um, was indeed Cyprus, what's happened in the north. And so, and it brought other people who'd heard about it only for the first time. So it's just trying to illustrate that there's ways that we can build up uh, momentum and international attention. And just finally, in conclusion, because before I uh, hear from others, is, is my interesting concern around freedom of religion or belief was also sparked, not least and triggered by what I saw and seen in the north, with, uh, whether it's for Orthodox Maronites and others who just cannot to this day manifest their faith to pray in the church where they grew up. Uh, and whether it's in Famagusta or elsewhere. And that is an absolute appalling abuse of people's fundamental right to believe. And it is gaining traction. People are concerned about this fundamental right because we see, we see it in Ukraine, we see it in, um, uh, we see it in uh, many other countries, uh, appalling persecution for people's right to believe. And you know, the Rohingya Muslims, the Uyghur Muslims, uh, Christians globally, one in seven are persecuted for their faith. Now we're going on for two years, two hours, sorry, two years, two hours, this mm -hmm. seminar probably. That, in that time, on average, a Christian has been murdered for their faith or belief. Um, it's a real issue, it's gaining interest. The UK hosted a, a very important international ministerial conference of a thousand people from a hundred countries and 30 ministers. And it's gaining interest because unless we get right that fundamental right, whether you believe, whether you have a religious belief or not, that right to have a faith or not, that right to believe, that right of conscience is something which is now in Cyprus being traduced, being abused. So we must do something about that. You know, Cy Cyprus, as I understand, was never based on religious divides, on religious conflict. 
It was never like that. But sadly, what is happening to this day is, yes, it began with cultural heritage and destruction and people destruction. And now the Islamization of the North, we now see in curricula in education, where imams are coming and then education is now showing a lack of tolerance, a lack of respect, a very un-Cypriot thing, a lack of respect for others. It's totally, talk to Turkish Cypriots, Greek Cypriots, so that I uh, love and friendship in my, in my community and uh, uh, in my area. That, that's not in their name. This isn't in their name, this kind of disrespect for others. And we must try and work with others to try and change this. Work with those who aren't Cypriot. Work with those who um, aren't, don't know anything about the Cypriot problem, but are concerned about human rights. And indeed, that should be those from all communities and all faiths, Muslims, uh, Christians, Orthodox, Maronites, Armenians, um, Turkish Cypriots, Greek Cypriots, everyone who's concerned about human rights. And that should be everyone in this country who has that fundamental concern, who is in this country because of those fundamental concerns. We must build a new alliance of folk. And that's what we saw at our conference. The right of freedom of religion belief is a right of advocacy on behalf of the other. It's not just Christians campaigning for Christians and Muslims for Muslims when they're persecuted. We're campaigning much better when we're campaigning for the others because it's when we have that right protected that the other, the, the, um, are, the, the minority, are particularly um, supported. So we must do that, and I, and I think there's real opportunities to do that. It was wonderful, and I encouraged it as when I was Deputy Special Envoy, noticing that Cyprus wasn't a member of our alliance of International Religious Freedom or Belief Alliance, that Cyprus wasn't there. And so I did have a word with one or two people I knew, and uh, the High uh, Commissioner here um, took steps along with uh, the um, Presidential Commissioner who I met, and then stepped, moves were made, and it, things move quickly yeah. in Cyprus. <laughs> I mean, this may surprise some of you. One month before. Uh, but, uh, but things move quickly and became a member one month before the conference, and uh, that's excellent. And it just shows that things can happen. And now, I think Cyprus can recognize with Armenia, with other countries that are concerned about these issues of freedom of religion or belief, that we can make this uh, a human, humanitarian concern, a, a human dignity concern, as much as it is a Cyprus concern. Thank you. Theodora. Yeah. <laughs> what? We're going to have a question after. Yeah. Uh, after Theodora. Okay. That's not for me. Okay. So um, I'm just going to change it a little bit. Um, in that, you know, we've heard all the things that are happening, we know for a very long time all the things that Turkey is inflicting on Cyprus, um, and the question is what can we do? And there are so many things that we can do, we've already started talking about what we can do. Um, for me, my day job is as a lawyer, I hold uh, individuals and countries accountable, not only for human rights violations, but also for crimes against humanity, and that also includes all victims of Turkey's um, crimes internally and externally. Um, and I'll return to the kind of work that I do on Turkey um, towards the end. But in um, 2014, um, and the date is important, the 14th of July 2014, um, I was in The Hague submitting and filing as part of a legal team a complaint to the International Criminal Court. Um, and this is the photo I sent to my father because the 14th of July is my dad's birthday, and those of you that know my father know how passionate he's about Cyprus. And so this was a perfect present for him to try and hold Turkey accountable for some of the crimes that it's committing. And as you can read up there, essentially what we've asked the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to do is to initiate an investigation as it now has, as he now has in the case of um, the Palestinians in Israel. Um, and looking at the crimes committed um, stemming from the um, civilian displacement and ethnic cleansing and settlement activities that Turkey, the government of Turkey, is committing in the Republic of Cyprus. Um, and this is a war crime. It's found under the Rome Statute, which you can see there, which is directly and indirectly transferring civil populations of 
occupying power into occupied territory. Now, you may think, well, why are we only focusing on transfer of populations? You know, we've spoken about the destruction of religious and cultural heritage. We know about the missing persons. We know about the executions that have happened um, and the mass burials. And we know about um, Turkey's continuing crimes. The problem we have when you're going to the International Criminal Court is that their mandate is limited. You can only bring before that court any crimes that have occurred since 2002. And so the only crime that has continued to occur that we could identify at the time was this. Um, and so that's why we took this narrow, but as I say, very significant aspect of Turkey's activities in Cyprus. And as I progress, you'll see how actually this displacement of populations and the importing of Turkish civilians <coughs> from the mainland is actually part of the Turkification program and in fact um, ethnic cleansing. Um, because essentially when you um, change the demographics of a country, when you replace and displace the indigenous populations of an area as has happened in Cyprus, um, with mainland Turks, this is a grievous war crime um, before international law. And it didn't just happen organically or just accidentally. We all know that you know this crime of population transfer is systematic, it is widespread, um, and the impact that it has on Cyprus and the future of trying to resolve Cyprus is tremendous because not only does it lean towards the eventual de facto annexation of, of um, the occupied areas to Turkey because of the population demographics, but it's also a, a tool that Turkey uses to say it's too difficult to allow all refugees to return to Cyprus because what do we do with everyone else that's currently living in Cyprus? In other words, what do we do with the settlers that we've imported into the occupied areas if we're going to allow the refugees and the internally displaced persons to return? So Turkey has had a clear policy of um, promoting the settlement of Turkish citizens. It not only encourages them, but it also provides financial aid, which is also unlawful under international law, and incentivizes um, mainland Turkish citizens to relocate to the occupied areas. And I didn't have time to look at the latest census the, the administration and the occupation has conducted, but back in 2006, at least 38.1% were Turkish settlers. Um, and that wasn't a true figure because it didn't include any children born to settlers and it also didn't include any unregistered mainland Turks, which Turkey classifies as guest workers. But we all know a simple signature on a document would convert all of these guests into formal citizens of the occupied areas. Um, and the other thing to note is that under international law, any development of the occupied territories is also unlawful, in particular where it indirectly causes population imports. Um, and so here I've set out for you the development of infrastructure. You know, international law is very clear. An occupier cannot develop the infrastructure of the area it occupies that is intended to go beyond the temporary nature of an occupation. You, those of you that have traveled and crossed the checkpoints into the occupied areas would have seen the tremendous infrastructure development that, that has happened. Um, this is also part of the crime. Secondly, something that we've looked and touched upon at Lobby is the educational institutions that have been established in the occupied areas. These universities are also part of this objective of Turkey to Turkify the area. It, um, you know, the students themselves are settlers if they like it or not. The, if you think about it, the language that the, most of these universities teach in is Turkish. So again, it's just uh, part of the whole Turkification of the occupied areas um, and goes part in part with what um, Fadis Fadil was saying about changing the names of places um, changing the time zone so it's out of Turkey, you know, some small things you think, but together they create what the Turkey's objective is, which is ultimate Turkification um, and de facto annexation of, of the occupied areas. And finally, development of tourism is also part and parcel of this objective. 
the development of the hotels are actually sponsored mainly by the Turkish Development Bank. So there you have subsidies for settlement, you also have ultimately the normalization of the occupation. And that's what strikes me if you go to Lidra, you see people crossing, coming back and forth, back and forth, as if they're just like crossing the road to go to a shop, not that they're actually moving from a free area into a military occupation. And there's nothing there to tell them that they're walking into a military area. And, you know, the occupied areas are largely a lawless areas. You spoke about trafficking. Um, that's something that we raise in our statements at Lobby for Cyprus. The, State the US State Department in their human rights report on Turkey highlights the high level of human trafficking that occurs there. Um, and beyond that, there are all the other illegalities that flow from, from a, a lawless state. So, so that's all part and path. But then you add to this the fact that any development that is occurring in the occupied areas is strictly only for either the Turkish Cypriots, which I don't have a problem with, but also the Turkish settlers. And this, when you measure, when you, whatever you do, when you're dividing a population along racial, ethnic, or religious groups, where you're creating separate reserves from, for certain groups, where you're expropriating property from one group to give to another to incentivize them either to move to the occupied areas or to live there, it's not, the name that it's known by is apartheid. It's creating segregation. It's creating an apartheid system. And so everything that is happening in, in the occupied areas has this added element of segregation. Um, and this seg and lobby again, you know, you've seen from our materials, you see again um, our, our um, photos, it's something that lobby has campaigned on that we will not support a by zone or by communal federation because it's a falsehood. It's a falsehood created by those that want to maintain control over us. Those of you who go to Cyprus know Cyprus. It's not just Greek and Turkish Cypriots that live there. There are a lot more nationalities and a lot of mixed marriages. A lot, you know, so this notion that we're only two communities and that we should continue down the by, by anything, it doesn't work for me because one, if we maintain this division of by communal anything, we're maintaining the segregation that exists. Any activity that is done should be done by all Cypriots for all Cypriots. And we should just cut it there. Because essentially, if you accept a by zone or by communal federation, you're effectively legalizing this this division, right? This division, and what is it again? You know, people want to say it's again along ethnic lines, it's Turks versus Greeks. It's not. Actually, it's what David was referring to, which is Muslims and non-Muslims, which stems back to the Ottomans. And that's really what's happening, is this religious division. So you're not pitting two ethnic communities against each other, you're pitting religious religions against either, each other. Because if you look at the Maronites and the Latins and all other Christians, they don't exist as minorities in Cyprus. They're religious minorities, which are in fact labeled as Greek Cypriots. So I, I, I think that's where I draw the line when it comes to by zone or anything, by commune or anything. It doesn't work because it just maintains this apartheid system. I transgress. Um, back to the ICC. Um, clearly, why would we go to the International Criminal Court? Because it meets the, the requirements. You know, It's admissible. Why is it admissible? Because clearly Turkey is unwilling to prosecute a single individual responsible for any of the crimes that are committed um, in the occupied areas. In fact, on the contrary, as many of you know, Turkey tends to reward those who serve in Cyprus in the occupied areas, especially those that happen to kill a few um, Greek Cypriots or in the full, full plain sight of the United Nations. So um, that is why it's admissible before the International Criminal Court because there is no other route. It's in the interest of justice because until individuals are brought to justice and are, are held accountable for the crimes that they continue to commit, there is a miscarriage of justice. And there's a miscarriage of justice because there is no other way to hold Turkey accountable before any um, court um, 
for what they, they are doing. Um, and effectively, why should we care? Why should we hold individuals accountable? Can't we forgive and forget and move on? Well, history teaches us a lot of things, and hindsight is a beautiful thing. Because we have failed to hold accountable a single person for, um, for the crimes in Turkey, what has happened is that these crimes are repeated not only by Turkey, but also by others. I mean, we was referred to Ukraine. Mm. Look at the destruction that is happening there. It's cultural destruction. It's happening because you know, one, one got away with it, so the other gets away with it. Look at ISIS. What was ISIS' MO? ISIS' MO was destruction of cultural heritage, destruction of religious heritage, erasing those that came before so that they can assert their superiority and claim over what they, they were trying to, to seek. And so essentially, you know, Cyprus is very instructive for what is happening globally. And a couple of weeks ago, I was in Brussels for an organization that I'm vice president of, and we had a mission specifically on Turkey. Not, not Cyprus, just Turkey. What is happening internally in Turkey with um, the human rights defenders, the minorities, um, you name it. Every vulnerable group has been attacked by the government in Turkey. And the connecting factor was this surreal moment that anyone that knows anything about Turkey and Erdogan woke up to the news that Erdogan was now the peacekeeper between the West <laughs> and Russia. <laughs> and that was just something. And you know, it's like what Dasullah was saying, which is that's what connected us. And I spoke about all the cases and the trials that we're observing in Turkey of human rights defenders and, and so forth. But I, of course, I'm Greek Cypriot, I will raise Cyprus. And I did, and I said, you know why all this is happening? Because you've ignored Cyprus for too long. You've let Turkey get away with it in, in Cyprus, so they're doing it in Syria. They're invading Iraq with ISIS, but, but who's reporting on it? No one. So I think Cyprus, it's really important to hold Turkey accountable for things that happen in, Tur in, in Cyprus, because if you fail to hold them accountable for one thing, they get away with it and they simply repeat, 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 and we are where we are. So. Um, in terms of what can we do next, this was filed in 2014. It what hasn't an investigation hasn't been opened. Um, we have had a lot of offers for assistance and research. So I, I'm going to propose to Lobby's executive that the next step we do is to send an update to push the pro current prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to open an investigation against Turkey for its crimes in Cyprus. Thank you. what you covered and um, uh, I think one of the main issues that we must now see very clearly is um, we mentioned, well Dasula mentioned about Turkey, Iran and Russia. Uh, and Russia and these three seem to be forming a trilateral um, team, a platform to work on uh, issues were discussed about, oh, are they looking at uh, developing an, um, their nuclear, their, their nuclear uh, weapons? Um, what really is the objective of these three nations now by meeting together? Is it putting pressure on the West? Um, do they think US are not as strong as they should be? NATO. NATO? Challenging NATO? I did mention um, uh, in another a discussion that we had that the Saudis, the Mediterranean, uh, sorry, the Middle Eastern countries are looking maybe to start their own equivalence to NATO, another NATO, but in in um, in their region. Um, a lot of things are changing, or a lot we're hearing a lot of things, um, and we have forgotten about other countries such as China and India in these equations as well. And where do they stand? Um, but I do agree with, uh, with Theodora that we must continue putting pressure and the legal pressure through international law, human rights and so forth. It is vital that we continue to do this because it does work. Yep, it does work, but we have to be um, present and again, uh, if I may say that our government uh, 
um, needs to drive this forward, um, which we're seeing that um, what uh, Dasula also said is that unfortunately we look at our, our politics in Cyprus as petty local politics and not international politics. Um, and I think that's another issue that we must raise when we meet these new presidential candidates who are going to come to the UK and ask us for their support. And they're all coming. I know Achille Lers, who I met in Cyprus a few weeks ago, is coming in October. Nigos uh, is going to come soon, uh, uh, and I'm sure Avera Fnofidu is going to come as well, looking for our votes here in the community. But I don't want it to be us voting for these people, these presidential candidates, just purely on political grounds, meaning that, oh, I'm from this political party in Cyprus, let's vote for this person. We should be voting for Cyprus. Challenge their agenda. Of course we will challenge their agenda, yes. Exactly what you said to Dasula. Challenge their agenda, and their agenda is Cyprus, number one. I'm not interested in anything else about Cyprus. What are you going to do about Cyprus? We in the diaspora, and most of us here are refugees. We want to go back home. 48 years we've waited. It's your responsibility, as presidential candidates, to have that on your agenda as number one when you come here to the diaspora and not talk to us about what the local politics in Cyprus is all about. No, we're not interested. We're interested in how we here in the United Kingdom can have an effect. And a lot of us here have also been discussing other ways that why are we not involved in the British political parties? Why are we involved in our local uh, Greek Cypriot parties here in the UK and not in becoming members of parliament? We have one member of parliament. One member of parliament. We should be having ten. Why do the Israelis have, the Indians and all the other parties? Why do their other countries have more MPs than we do? Are they more intelligent than us? I think statistically, we are number probably two in the world with qualifications. Bachelors, masters, PhDs, we can pile them up. But why are we not in politics here in the UK to challenge David? No, but not in his, ter in his area. I wish we had um, more of us here in the community to be able to drive this forward, which we're not seeing at this moment in time. Um, before I ask you, um, first of all, to put your questions to anyone in the panel, I think it's uh, important because uh, today, marks the 48th year of the invasion of our country. And I woke up with the church bells ringing, a lot of us did, not knowing what was happening. And then we found out, wow, the invasion. So may I ask if we could have a one minute's silence as um, to mark this very important day, the 20th of July, 1974. And all who died, of course. And of course, and the hum humanitarian and loss of lives uh, of our people in Cyprus. Please, let's be standing. Thank you. Uh, tonight, I think we should do what David suggested. Act now. The Ukrainian-Russian war, it gives us the opportunity to expose the double standards the West has. Uh, it's about time the crimes that have committed in Cyprus should be exposed widely. It should be an outcry. Uh, 48 years 
in three years would be a half a century. How long are we going to tolerate that? The world is not listening, is not caring about a small island when they have Ukraine. They congratulate um, the people of Ukraine and reward them for their resistance against the Russians. But as far as, uh, as Cyprus is concerned, they, 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 uh, they uh, prove they, 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 the invaders, they approve and condemn the victims. We, have two th we had thousands of refugees in London and we had to go through a sanctuary challenge to force the th uh, Thatcher government to do something about the refugees. Eventually, she did give 2,000 refugees the right to stay. You know, it's been a struggle. Why should it be a struggle? Now, the situation in Ukraine is so easy. Everybody is really uh, support, and they should support. We don't disagree with that. Boris Johnson went twice to Ukraine, despite of all the problems he faced. He went twice to show his support. This did not happen to Cyprus. Cyprus is a small island, but it's us, the Cypriots. We are 300,000 Cypriots in London. We should act together. To this small theater should have been packed today. You know, what are they, what are they doing? It's an outcry. We are entitled to this outcry against the double standards. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to call uh, Nikos Savidis for the second and final song. Um, Nikos is from Amohostos. He, he, from childhood, he loved music. And uh, I know that he first had a group called The Rock. Was it The Rock? That's right. Uh, many, many years ago. I think it was in 19... Uh, 67. Uh, that, I, do, I do remember, I do remember, yes. And he came, to, he came to England to study, he went to the army, came to England to study as well. And in 1974, on the, on the, um, uh, uh, on the what date was it? 18th of July, he was planning to come to England. Sorry, he was planning to go back to Cyprus. And we had the coup on the 15th of July and he couldn't return. He then continued to stay in Cyprus. We know how he loves his music and how he's been in the community together with his bouzouki player. Yes, uh, George Gregorio. Uh, and um, I just want to thank you, Nico, for coming tonight, but supporting our community at every event. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank Mr. Evgeny on the double standards story, because my mother was a victim in 1982 refugee. Thank you. You know the story very well, Mr. Evgeny. Thank you very much. And I agree with Tasula about the once illegal, always illegal, let's see. And the, the settlers are a, a product of a war crime. Put it in simplistic. It's against the law to bring settlers, isn't it? Yes. Thank you very much. Nothing difficult about it. They didn't think about me, 48 years, I cannot go back to my house, but they think of the poor kids who are brought up. It's not their fault, but they are product of this but Nico, I'm illegality. Sorry. Again, if yeah. you look at the pitching, our problem with the yeah. rest, we should turn around to Europe and say, when you learn to integrate your diversity or your Muslim yeah. minority into Europe without problems, we'll do the same. Yeah. Come, but we never use that part, is it? Okay, sorry. I'm going to say something. I'm going to say something. I'm going to say something. Number two. Okay, one, two, three, go. 
Έπλασεντα η μοίρα μου να περπατώ στα ξένα μία νολάτσερη ζωή σε ένα μεγάλο ψέμα. Έφερεντα η τύχη μου να ζω τώρα στα πέρα το πεπρωμένο μια ζωή να τραούδω για σένα. Να τραούδω για λόγου σου τι προς αγαπημένη και μοναχά για χάρη σου τι προς απατημένη να τραγουδώ για λόγου σου τι προς μου προδομένη και μοναχά για χάρη σου τι προς απατημένη κι ας με λαλούν απόδειμο κι ας μου ρουφούν το γέμα Hey, I'm not a nephia. Hey, I'm a puta xena. Jan me la lusin prosfiga. Jan me travai dorema. Sto spidi muston dopo mu. Ergu me kafe mera. Na travu do ya lo usu. Ki prosaga pi meni. Che mona kaya karisu. Τι προς απατημένη να τραγουδώ για λόγου σου Τι προς μου προδομένη και μοναχά για χάρη σου Τι προς αγαπημένη Έτσι που σε έκαμα συν Τι προς μου να δακρύζεις Τώρα που σε μοιράσα συν Λαλό σου με λυγίσεις Μέρες πολλά καλύτερες Πάλι να ξαναζήσεις Πάλι να ζήσεις λεύτερη Λεύτερη και ενωμένη Να τραγουδώ για λόγου σου Κι προς μου το αμπημένη Και μοναχά για χάρη σου Κι προς απατημένη Να τραγουδώ για λόγου σου Κι προς μου το αμπημένη Και μοναχά για χάρη σου Κι προς απατημένη Να τραγουδώ για λόγου σου Κι προς μου προδομένη Και μοναχά για χάρη σου Κύπρος αγαπημένη, Κύπρος αγαπημένη, Λεύτερη λύτρωμένη. Thank you. Ναι, αυτά βγαίνουν από την ψυχή μας. Ναι. Με την πάω. Του είναι εθνικό ύμνο. Σε γνωρίζω από την κόψη του σπαθιού την τρομερή Σε γνωρίζω από την όψη που με βιά μετράει τη γη Απ' τα κόκκαλα βγαλμένη των Ελλήνων τα ιερά και σαν ρότα ανδριωμένη χέρο χέρε λευτεριά και σαν ρότα ανδριωμένη χέρο χέρε λευτεριά 